At Kroger, we want our fresh produce to meet your expectations, which is why we're dedicated to doing up to a 27-point inspection on our fruits and veggies, checking for things like scarring. In fact, only the best produce like zesty oranges and crisp carrots reach our shelves. Because when it comes to fresh, our higher standards mean fresher produce. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Save big on your favorites with the buy five or more, save a dollar each sale. Simply buy five or more participating items and save a dollar each with your card. Kroger, fresh for everyone. 92% of households that start the year with Peloton are still active a year later. 92% because of a bike? Not just bikes. We also make treadmills and rowers. Oh, let me guess, for elite athletes only, right? Nope. It doesn't matter if you're an avid exerciser or new to working out. Peloton can help you achieve your fitness goals. 92% stick with it. So can you. Try Peloton bikes, tread or row, risk-free with a 30-day home trial. New members only. Not available in remote locations. See additional terms at onepeloton.com slash home dash trial. Welcome to episode 175 of Real Life Ghost Stories. To kick things off this week, I need to thank some of our newest Patreon subscribers. I would like to thank Barbara Linares, Micah May, Jodie UD, Valeria Vastag, Anna Backe, Dalia Zelko, Amy Pieri, Barbara Nelson, Levi Gifford, Carrie Ann Valandri, Gloria, Margaret M, Mylan Martin, Kate Me, Jeffrey Delicate Character, Elizabeth Avery, Bento Bunny, Courtney Goodrich, Mary Jane Pelton, and Sad Pennywise. Thank you so much for subscribing to the Patreon. I love you and appreciate you every single day. And our film review this week, our film review is Oma. Oma was released in 2022. It has 4.6 out of 10 on IMDb and 32% on Rotten Tomatoes. A woman's quiet life on an American farm takes a terrifying turn when the remains of her estranged mother arrive from Korea. This film has been on my watch list for ages and I was really excited to watch it. So I'm going to I'm going to dive straight into the likes, but I am going to warn you that I think this film review is actually going to be quite short. It might be the shortest film review I have ever done on this podcast. So my likes. I love Sandra Oh and I was really excited to watch a horror film with her in it. Because I think she's a great actor. I think she is absolutely stunning to look at. And she also plays really cool, interesting roles. So when I saw she was in this, I was like, yes, absolutely. I want to see Sandra Oh in a horror film. I want to see her absolutely like powerhouse it. That's what I wanted. So I was really excited to see her in the film. And I'm also somebody who loves a film about trauma, you know? <laughs> give me give me a film about trauma any day. I am a beacon of light and hope. And I just love to watch people suffer. And this film is all about the exploration of the relationship between mother and daughter and how that like develops throughout the generations. And there's that big question of can you really escape from turning into your parents? And if you have an abusive relationship with a parent in your formative years what does that mean for your relationship with your children if you choose to go on and have them so there's a lot of really big deep topics to be explored here and I personally think these things are really important to explore through the horror genre I said it when I when we spoke about Candyman that this is happening more and more that horror films are becoming psychological and we're taking really deep looks at the human condition and the impact of generational trauma is insane and what happens when a child is abused and how they respond as an adult like how do we escape becoming our parents and can we ever and all those questions are really big important questions and it was as a film it was it was visually beautiful like it was stunning I loved the setting kind of in the wilds of America I loved the fact that Sandra Oh and her daughter Chrissy were beekeepers And they lived this really remote off the grid life. Kind of loved all that. I loved the exploration of elements of Korean culture that I didn't know about. Especially when it came to honouring your dead and your dead family members and your dead ancestors. And how that looks and why that's really important. All of those things I loved. That's my likes column. My dislikes column. I 
was so disappointed in this film. I was so disappointed. I actually, it took me three goes to watch it. So I had to stop it twice to take a break. And not because it was too hard to watch, but because frankly, I was really bored. And that is not what I want to say about a horror film. I found that the dialogue was really clunky. And I I didn't, I, I don't know who wrote this film in terms of the script, but like, I didn't like the dialogue at all. And I, I have to say, much known as I love Sandra Oh, and I think she's great and I wanted to see her being a powerhouse. I feel like she didn't have much to work with and the acting wasn't great. So apparently this film was the first horror film that this director has directed. And you know what? You could see it because I had written down in my dislikes, there were moments that were so badly edited and therefore the scare was completely lost. And that really shocked me. I thought, hang on, that's just badly done. Like you surely can see that that's not well done. And moments that just didn't build any tension. So you know in a horror film, you know there's a jump scare coming. You feel the tension, the music swoops, you you know what's going to happen and you're on the edge of your seat waiting for it. I felt like this film had zero tension and all of the scares, all of the moments that were meant to be scary, I just thought, well, this isn't scary at all because there's been no build up. You know, there's been no, there's been no indication that anything's going to happen and suddenly there's an old woman in the corner, but actually I don't really care about the old woman in the corner. I personally thought it was far too predictable and it being really predictable and coupled with this weird lack of tension meant that like I said I got really bored and I had to keep pausing it to go and walk around and take a break and then come back and watch it. It wasn't for me. I just didn't I didn't particularly enjoy it. What I do like is A learning about other cultures through horror films because I think it's interesting and B I am a big fan of having female led horror films about women and the relationships between women and I think that that's really important and I'm here for it and I like watching it those two things are a yes everything else I just don't think it was a very good horror film to be honest it's going to be two stars for me today's episode is sponsored by HelloFresh I cannot keep risking life and limb in this zombie apocalypse to go to the grocery store. If only there was an easier way. Wait, what's this conveniently placed leaflet? With HelloFresh you get farm fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and the impending zombie doom and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. You know what will really take your mind off the flesh-hungry horde? Fast and fresh recipes. HelloFresh's latest line of meals featuring robust flavours and filling portions are ready in less than 15 minutes. Enjoy taste and quality done quick with recipes like falafel power bowls, seared steak and potatoes with Bernays sauce or southwest pork and bean burritos and let's face it, in the zombie apocalypse, we gotta cook smart and we gotta cook fast. And you know what? We don't all want to be out there fighting our way to the store so you can stock up on snacks, sides, desserts and more at HelloFresh Market. Simply add these staples and sweets to your weekly order and they'll arrive on your doorstep along with your meals. More yummy food, less mortal peril. Fictional zombie apocalypse aside, I have actually used HelloFresh in real life for years and I love it. I used them long before I ever advertised for them. It saved me so much time, so much money and so much food waste. I'm also not a very good cook, so it allows me to cook and eat better. Go to HelloFresh.com slash RealLifeGhostStories22 and use the code RealLifeGhostStories22 for 22 free meals plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash RealLifeGhostStories22 and use code Real Life Ghost Stories 22 for 22 free meals plus free shipping. Oh no. Oh no, what is that? Oh no, no, it was meant to be fictional. It wasn't meant to be real. 92% of households that start the year with Peloton are still active a year later. 92% because of a bike? 
not just bikes. We also make treadmills and rowers. Oh, let me guess, for elite athletes only, right? Nope. It doesn't matter if you're an avid exerciser or new to working out. Peloton can help you achieve your fitness goals. 92% stick with it. So can you. Try Peloton bikes, tread or row, risk-free with a 30-day home trial. New members only. Not available in remote locations. See additional terms at onepeloton.com slash home dash trial. Which brings us to our story this week. Now, this story has been on my list literally for the last four years. And it will sound familiar to you and you will hear why it sounds familiar when we crack on and get into this story. So a bit of a word of warning. There's a there's a bit of religiosity in this story in that there are references to religion and references to Psalms and various different things. And I think it's important to mention that before we begin. Like I'm not a religious person, but it is important to the story to talk about these things. So that's why. And with that being said, let's get straight into the story. This is not the first time that I've spoken about this case. So if you feel like you've heard some of the details before, you are not mistaken. In episode two, we discussed Demon House, which was a documentary released by Zach Bagans that explored one of the most haunted houses in Indiana, allegedly. It's a tricky story to unpick, as it is a modern tale and it's also a tale about demonic possession. Now, if you've been around for a while, you will know that I have thoughts about claims of demonic possession. But the reason I've chosen to do this story is because of the sheer amount of witnesses that are involved in it. Not only is there an extended family who witnessed these bizarre events, but also healthcare workers, social workers and the police. Something happened in that house. Something that has been cited as one of the most unusual cases ever handled by the Department of Children's Services in Indiana. This story is freely available to find online, but the mother in the story requested at various points that the names of her children be changed in order to protect their anonymity. So for the sake of clarity, the names of all parties will be changed in this retelling of the story. And buckle up because things get very weird very quickly. The house was small. It was uninteresting. It stood unremarkable on the street. But it was home. And for Teresa and her mother Rhonda, they knew it was perfect. Teresa's three small children ran around them gambling between the two women and running up the steps of the small house. Is this it? they called. Is it ours? This was home. This plain looking little rental cottage was home. Teresa and Rhonda grabbed what they could carry and ushered the three children up the steps and into the house. The children bounced and dodged from room to room arguing about what was going to go where and who was going to get what bed and musing about all of the sleepovers they were going to have in this house. As anyone who has moved house will know, it easily becomes a long and drawn out process, and despite the fact that the children aged 7, 9 and 12 were technically at the right age to be able to help, they were far more interested in exploring the quiet neighbourhood and staking claims to beds to be of real use. But eventually, Teresa and Rhonda had the house looking pretty good, and they felt like they were home. It was December, and it had been a chilly night. Rhonda had roused herself and wrapped herself up in a thick fleeced nightgown and padded softly down to the kitchen to get the coffee on. The house was deathly quiet. The children were all still deep asleep, and she knew that Teresa would join her soon for a coffee and a quiet chat about the running order of the day. As she stood over the coffee machine, she heard a faint buzzing around her ear and swiped it away. A rogue fly in December, she thought. And then she listened. Really listened. The buzzing had continued, but it was a heavy sort of hum, deeper and more resonant, and was coming from behind her. She turned slowly, not sure of what she would see, but she felt suddenly and inexplicably gripped with fear. Behind her was a screened-in porch, and it was smothered in big black flies, buzzing and swarming and crawling over each other. She gasped in shock, having never seen such a concentration of flies in one place, and also recognising the fact that it was December, 
and it was icy cold. Where could they possibly be coming from? Teresa shuffled into the kitchen, yawning, and almost walked straight into her mother, who was still standing staring at the dark, buzzing cloud that was continuing to descend upon their porch. Jesus Christ, Teresa breathed to her mother. How in the world do we get rid of those? The flies came relentlessly. The first thing to do was obviously call in the exterminator, which they dutifully did, and the flies were disposed of, until they came back again. Buzzing black swarms would gather like clouds and descend upon the house, moving around it like great pulsating shadows. The landlord was completely perplexed. They did everything they could to get rid of them. Rhonda knocked on the doors of the neighbours and no one else had any issues with insects of any kind. It was as though the flies were attracted to their little cottage, but there was no discernible reason why. The war of the flies became an ongoing battle and weirdly, Rhonda and Teresa just got used to them. But the flies were soon to become the least of their worries. Teresa was lying awake. Cold and clammy sweat formed on her face. She listened straining her ears in the darkness to try and hear what was happening in her house. The children were asleep, she knew that. And she could hear the steady thump of footsteps down in the basement. Slow and deliberate footsteps, trudging up and down the basement. Her thoughts were frantic. What if this time it was somebody? What if there was somebody in her basement? How had they gotten in? But somewhere inside her, she knew that there wasn't somebody in the basement. This wasn't the first time the footsteps had happened. She could almost map their journey to a T at this point. But she had to check. She knew she just had to check just in case. She lowered her legs slowly onto the floor as silently as she could and made her way to the bedroom door. She opened the door and as her eyes adjusted to the light, she realised that she wasn't alone in the hallway. Rhonda was standing in the hallway with one hand still on her bedroom door. Her face strained. She had been lying in the darkness listening to the footsteps again. The women stared at each other. No words were exchanged, but they both knew exactly how frightened the other was. As they listened... The footsteps made their way back down the basement and they heard the telltale creak of the first step of the basement stairs and then the second step. Teresa's eyes widened. Jesus Christ, it was coming up the basement stairs. She motioned at her mother to get back in her bedroom and close her door and Teresa would do the same. The steps were coming closer. Teresa silently stepped backwards into her bedroom, Rhonda doing the same. The steps were at the top of the basement stairs now. Teresa and Rhonda started to close their doors, both wincing at the strain of trying to avoid even the smallest creak. The door handle on the basement door rattled, and they both heard the distinctive click of the door opening and the creak of it swinging open. Teresa hardly dared to breathe as the footsteps came closer to their bedrooms. Her door was open just a crack. She was terrified, but she had to see. She had to know who was in her house. Night after night, these footsteps were giving her waking nightmares, and she had to see. The footsteps drew nearer, and she held her breath. Counting down from five, she built up the courage and just as the steps were right outside the bedroom door, she flung her door open and burst out into the hallway. And nothing. No man, woman or child stunned in the hallway, nothing. Nothing but quiet in the dim light. But it was suddenly very, very cold. And as she looked down, she noticed wet boot prints that led from the basement down the hallway and stopped where she was standing. Just like the flies, the mystery footsteps became a strange part of their nightly routine. 
The footsteps would circle the basement, come up the stairs, walk down the hallway, and nothing they could do seemed to stop it. They locked the doors, hoping that this would be a sufficient enough barrier to keep the thing in the basement, but to no avail. The children began to take notice. Mom, why are you stomping around the house at night time? Mom, why are you slamming doors all the time? It was becoming increasingly difficult to keep the activity from the children, and Rhonda and Teresa were becoming more and more concerned. Items seemed to be moving of their own accord, disappearing and reappearing in unlikely places. But they lived in a house with three children. Surely that could account for at least some of it. But the children couldn't be used to explain the shadow figure that they had begun to see out of the corner of their eyes lurking in the living room. In the blink of an eye it would be gone, but it was there. They had seen it. A darkness that was blacker than black. One day the shadow lunged towards Teresa. She screamed, cowering, thinking this was it, this intruder was going to get her, but as it lunged towards her it disappeared into nothing. She was so terrified that she called the police. But was it all their imagination? Everyone in the house was struggling to sleep and lack of sleep can cause all sorts of visual and auditory hallucinations so was this shadow man just a creation of perception and circumstance? Whatever the family believed was happening at the time, it all came to a head on March the 10th, 2012, just four months after the family had moved in. The household was mourning a death and so the family were up with friends celebrating the life that they had lost. The energy was charged with nostalgia and loss and the rumbling of voices was punctuated by laughter and sobs. Teresa went to check on the children to ensure that they were soundly asleep and when she reached her 12-year-old daughter's room she staggered backwards, slumped against the wall in shock. Mama! she screamed. Mama! She scrambled onto her hands and knees to her daughter's bedside and each person that ran to that room stopped in their tracks at what they saw in that bedroom. The 12-year-old was levitating feet off the bed. Lying perfectly flat, still asleep, her eyes shut, levitating above the bed. Without knowing what else to do, Teresa started to pray, as did Rhonda and the other family members and slowly the 12-year-old descended back onto her bed and opened her eyes, shocked to see a sea of wide-eyed faces staring back at her. She had no recollection of what had happened, or why all of these people were in her room. That was it for Rhonda and Teresa. Rhonda held her daughter's hand and said, We need help. We need to talk to someone who knows how to deal with it. They didn't exactly know what it was or what it wanted or how they might go about getting it out of their lives but they decided the first port of call was to solicit the help of any local churches that they could most of the churches were far from accommodating and as the search became more and more frantic the incidents in the house were mounting up Clairvoyants got wind of all the activity and all had different interpretations, with one telling Teresa that her house was a house of 200 demons. A church contacted them and told them that they needed to clean the house with bleach and ammonia and then use oil to draw crosses on every single door and window of the house. Teresa obliged, desperate for anything to keep her children safe. She doused the hands and feet of her children in oil and smeared the sign of the cross on their foreheads. At the advice of one of the clairvoyants, she built a makeshift altar in the basement and placed upon it statues of Mary, Joseph and Jesus. She left a Bible open on Psalm 91. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. and all was quiet. The quiet was, of course, merely the calm before the storm. A moment of peace before the situation in the house escalated beyond all control and it all centred around the children. Teresa could hear her youngest, her little seven-year-old, chitter-chattering with someone down the hallway and at first she took no notice, but idly listened to the rise and fall of his little voice. 
but then the hairs on the back of her arms began to prickle. There was another voice, a deeper voice. There was somebody in the house talking to her son. Her instincts kicked in and she flew down the corridor and into her son's bedroom where he was nowhere to be seen. A hush had fallen on the house as though it had taken a big, deep breath and was waiting to see what happened next. She spotted a flicker of movement in the slats of the closet and stepped forward to open it, and there sat her little boy completely alone. Baby? Are you playing a game? Who are you talking to? I'm not playing a game, Mommy. I'm talking to my friend. The shadows were trying to grab me, so I came here and he came here too. Who is your friend, baby? Tell me about him. With that, the little boy bristled. For the first time, he turned and looked at his mother with a strange smile on his face. I will kill you. The imaginary friend of the seven-year-old told him all sorts of things, particularly pertaining to death and what it felt like to die. At one point, Rhonda had sent the children to brush their teeth and only the seven-year-old remained, dilly-dallying in an effort to avoid going to bed. She heard him gasp, the gasp cut short and replaced by the sounds of him struggling, and then Rhonda watched as he was hurled through the air and out the bathroom door. There was no way he could have jumped. He was physically thrown by something. That night, the family stayed in a hotel, an event which became more and more frequent as time went on. Clairvoyants and people of the clergy came and many witnessed strange phenomena like items levitating in one incident, a bottle floated across the room, there were flickering lights, the sound of footsteps and slamming doors and the children's behaviour was becoming more and more bizarre and worrying. They frequently spoke in deep guttural voices, threatening the people around them and were at times violent. The eldest daughter spoke of something holding her down in bed at night time and a deep voice that would whisper in her ear and say You are never going to see your family again. On April the 19th, 2012, Teresa had had enough and in desperation she went to see her family doctor. The doctor was understandably concerned about the story that Teresa told. The children weren't sleeping and thus they weren't going to school. She believed her children to be possessed by something and that her house was haunted. Doors were slamming and she could hear footsteps and she believed that there was something demonic. The doctor decided that the best course of action was to get an immediate psychiatric evaluation for Teresa and to call child services to properly interview the children of the house in order to establish whether there was abuse or neglect happening in the home. What happened next is widely recorded. And I promise you, I have not exaggerated any elements of this part of the story for effect. Where I have quoted directly, these quotes are taken from the official child services report. The first step for the doctor was for him to try and speak to the children, especially the two boys, who seemed to be behaving in a most disturbed manner. The boys snapped, barked and growled at the doctor like wild animals. And according to medical staff, the youngest boy, and I quote was lifted and thrown into the wall with nobody touching him. The boys then slipped into a trance-like state and no one could rouse them. The doctor's office was chaos. No one could fully understand exactly what was happening, but something was clearly very, very wrong. Someone called 911 and within a matter of minutes, eight police officers and multiple ambulances showed up and the family were taken to the Methodist Hospital in Gary, Indiana where the nine-year-old boy woke up and was behaving completely normally, like nothing had happened. The seven-year-old, however, continued to shout in a demonic voice and thrash around. It took five men to hold him down. In the meantime, a social worker arrived on the scene, and the following record was reported in the Indiana Star, who were granted access to all reports by Teresa herself. DCS family case manager Valerie Washington was asked to handle the initial investigation. She gave the following account to police and in her intake officer's report. Hospital personnel examined Teresa and her children and found them to be healthy and free of marks or bruises. The hospital psychiatrist evaluated Teresa and determined that she was of sound mind. 
Washington interviewed the family in the hospital. While she spoke with Teresa, the seven-year-old boy started growling with his teeth showing, his eyes rolled in the back of his head. The boy locked his hands around his older brother's throat and refused to let go until Adults prized his hands open. Later that evening, Washington and registered nurse Willie Lee Walker brought the two boys into a small examination room for an interview. Rhonda joined them. The seven-year-old stared into his brother's eyes and began to growl. It's time to die, the boy said in a deep, unnatural voice. I will kill you. While the youngest boy spoke, the older brother started headbutting Rhonda in the stomach. Rhonda grabbed her grandson's hand and started praying. According to Washington's original DCS report, an account corroborated by Walker, the nurse, the nine-year-old boy had a weird grin and walked backwards up a wall to the ceiling. He then flipped over Rhonda, landing on his feet. He never let go of his grandmother's hand. He walked up the wall, flipped over and stood there, Walker told the star. There is no way that he could have done that. Later, police asked Washington whether the boy had run up the wall as though performing an acrobatic trick. No, Washington told them. She said the boy, and I quote, glided backwards on the floor, wall and ceiling, according to the police report. Everyone was panicked now. The social worker and the healthcare worker left the room in shock. The social worker and the nurse reported to the doctor what had just happened and the child could not remember what had happened and nor could he replicate it. The children were removed from the household due to a spiritual and emotional distress. In the time the children were removed from Teresa's custody, Reverend Michael Maginot was called to the house to do an exorcism. In the house he alleged that he witnessed lights flickering, blinds swinging without any draught and he saw wet footprints appear in the living room. Police and social services were sent to investigate the house as a protocol to ensure that it was fit for the children to be living in. The police officers stated in their official reports that their flashlights had died despite having new batteries, that their recorded audio picked up voices whispering and that pictures that they took seemed to show spectral images of shadowy white figures. En route back to the police station, the police officer's car began inexplicably malfunctioning. The police officers noted that the house seemed to be oozing a strange liquid that was slippery yet sticky at various points throughout the house and they could find no reason or explanation for it. A social worker who accompanied the police on one of their visits touched the liquid and as she did, it suddenly went from slippery and viscous to a hard solid material and her finger went completely numb. She later said that it felt like her finger had been physically broken. An exorcism was performed on Teresa and the house, but she never returned to that house. Her children were returned to her and she moved to a different house. The house of 200 demons was bought and demolished by none other than Zach Bagans. And in a children's services report dated January the 10th, 2013, it was reported that there was, and I quote, no demonic presences or spirits in their new home. Okay, this story is so complex and there is so much going on. But before we get into any of the nitty gritty of it, I cannot recommend the article from the Indie Star enough. It's linked in the description and it's well worth a read. I actually thought, in fairness, as a as a piece that's designed to be a little bit sensational and like get people reading and whatever, it was very fair and very balanced. It covered kind of both sides of the story, like what the psychologists had to say, what the police had to say, what the family had to say. And I thought it was very non-judgmental and I would recommend that if you want to kind of deeper dive into this story, that is the article to do it from. I kind of felt like I could nearly just like read the article word for word and it would have made a really good episode. Do you know what I mean? Obviously, I didn't do that, but it's definitely well worth a read. Um, And as always, just to remind you, the links to any sources that I get my information from are always linked in the description of each episode. So go there if you want kind of what all of the professionals had to say and all the different investigations that they did into the house. Like the police went into the house numerous times. It wasn't just once. Um, But I didn't want to kind of go through every single bit of the police being in the house. And it's a very strange story. Um, 
the other thing that I think is really important to say when we're talking about stories like this is that this story was, I mean, it was famous anyway, but it was sort of immortalized by Zach Bagans. And I think he just, I think the documentary was just called Demon House. And by the end of the documentary, he demolished the house and um, took the stairs, I think, the, the basement stairs to his museum. Fine, Zach, you do you. The problem I have with stuff like this is that the word demonology and demonologists they're bandied around an awful lot and I actually think I, I'm pretty light-hearted about everything paranormal you know I feel a bit like you do you everybody's allowed to have their own beliefs etc etc but when you use words like demonology and demonologists in the context of these people who come on these tv shows or they come on these documentaries or they reference themselves in articles or whatever and they talk about themselves as demonologists they're talking about I understand how these demons work in the modern day. You've got an infestation of demons in your house. Oh, that that oily substance on your wall, that's a demon. I know because I'm a demonologist. That's not what demonology is. And if somebody's calling themselves a demonologist, you need to have your heckles up and take everything those people say with a pinch of salt. Uh, demonology is a very real thing, but it is not what it is portrayed as in the Hollywood world at the moment. So demonology is the study of the mythology of demons. So the mythology of demons within the Bible, the mythology of demons within different cultures, in stories, in poems, all of that stuff. It is not a modern day interpretation of what demons are doing if they're knocking around in a house in Gary, Indiana. So that's just, that's a, my, own, that's my own personal bugbear. It really annoys me. And on the topic of the goo, right? The goo that was gooing from the walls, the goo that was gooing all over the house. Is this not what CSI was made for? Is this not what all of those science montages in films were made for? You get a sample of the goo, you bring the goo to the lab, and the lab tells you what the goo is. They say, we've tested your goo, we found out your goo is a stage 7 demon, or we found out your goo is actually just olive oil that they've been splashing around the house. Whatever it is, why are people not testing the goo? Test the goo, people. I want to know what that goo was. Also, don't be touching random goo in people's houses with your own fingers. Because I wouldn't particularly be worried about ending up with a broken finger like that woman, that like that social worker allegedly did. I would be worried about diseases from unknown goo. How many times have I just said goo in the last minute? I don't know. But, you know, the, the goo got me. The goo got me. And the lack of investigation into the goo got me as well. I want to know about the goo. I'm interested in the goo. But apparently it was like dripping from the ceilings. It was like all over the walls. The police did this test kind of on the spot where they wiped all the goo away and um, left the room, locked the door and then came back 25 minutes later and the room was just completely full of goo again. <laughs> stop saying goo. Emma, stop saying goo. Sorry, I will stop using that word now. But it was there. Nobody could figure out what it was or where it was coming from. So demonology and goo aside, how did we get here with this story? What happened? I've got thoughts about it. I don't believe that the house was haunted. That's my that's my gut instinct about it. Now, there doesn't seem to be any evidence that Teresa and her family have ever had any experience since doesn't seem that they're in this new house and that there's no pattern repeating itself you know there's been no kind of oh my kids are possessed nothing at all since there are claims that she was in financial difficulty and was really behind on her rent when this uh, when this all started now I understand that people being in financial difficulty that people will will they will try and find a way out especially when there's kids involved they will do anything to find a way out I just don't know if a long-term haunting is the way out of financial difficulty. Like, I don't know. I know when people make that claim, they're like, oh, they're, they're thinking about movie deals, they're thinking about book deals, they're thinking about like, oh, I don't really know, what, but that's really so far into the future and such a gamble. Like, there are more instantaneous ways to make money than banking it all on Hollywood picking up your ghost story in Gary, Indiana. I don't really know what the financial advantage is of claiming that either you or your children are possessed and that all this stuff is happening in your house. First of all, it's incredibly difficult to prove. And second of all, you're not going to see any financial rebate from that for a really long time, in my opinion anyway. So I kind of, I don't really understand the financial 
the financial angle of it and when people say oh she didn't have very much money and that's why she did it like you can't turn around to your landlord and say I'm not paying rent because the house is haunted I don't think that's going to fly you know and landlords don't have the reputation for being the most empathetic people in the world when it comes to paying your rent on time you know you pay your rent or you get in trouble I don't think a haunted house is going to suffice for not paying your rent where a house full of goo on the other hand I'm not paying my rent if my house is full of goo and flies that's a fact on a really serious note um the psychological reports of the children are really interesting so psychologists got involved when the children were taken into care and they interviewed the children and I think particularly the youngest one the seven-year-old the psychologist said that the possession in inverted commas would come out when the seven-year-old was challenged about something or when he had done something wrong or when it was perceived that he had been naughty or whatever then the demon voice would come out so the psychologist believed it was kind of a way of not getting in trouble of getting away with doing things there was a lot of psychological musing as to whether or not the children were kind of living out the mother's delusions but the mother was tested by psychiatrists and psychologists multiple times and deemed to be of very sound mind and they didn't think that she actually was suffering from any delusions but the children seemed to be acting out something that was um coming from somewhere in the household and I wondered about the grandmother because she was living in the household too I wondered if she was the source of the possession narrative and it does seem like there were behavior issues with the children in the home now none of the articles I read went into what these behavioral issues were but it seems like the psychologists were suggesting that demonic possession was kind of an excuse for behavioral issues which it's a pretty extreme excuse but having worked with children who have very extreme behaviors I have genuinely seen demonic possession being posited as a possibility from parents when their children's behavior is so out of control that they don't even know how to explain it or they don't even understand why it's happening so you might think that it's beyond the realms of possibility that people might think demonic possession is is the cause of certain behaviors but actually it does happen and people do think that I do very much wonder about the grandmother at a point in the story in a report she said the demons don't affect me because I was blessed by my birth so she believed that she was unaffected by all of the demonic behavior in the house because she was somehow more blessed than the others in the household which I thought was a very strange thing to say and it was interesting that it's the two boys as well and not so much the girl although the girl did report having what sounded like episodes of pretty extreme sleep paralysis so there's so much psychology going on here right and you can kind of try and psychoanalyze this family from afar forever but either way whatever happened paranormal or otherwise this family experienced something that obviously was really traumatic for all of them pushed them to their wits end they must have all been terrified They must have been absolutely petrified. The children were taken away, which must have been so traumatic for everybody, for the children and for the mother and for the grandmother included. And I'm glad that everything calmed down and they all got to live back together again and that everything seemed to be okay, right? The bit about this story that really gets to me is all the professionals involved that now, even still to this day, will talk about this case. Like one of the police officers said that he went into that house a non-believer and came out a believer because of the stuff he witnessed in that house the nurse who witnessed the boy walking backwards up the wall will still talk about it to this day and say that is what happened that child walked up the wall and flipped over his grandmother and I do not understand how that happened or how he did it I thought when I first saw this story that perhaps the child like the police suggested sort of took a run at the wall in a kind of a parkour kind of thing and it took everybody by surprise so it got exaggerated or people were like whoa how did he do that there's no way he could have done that that was my instinct when I was first looking at this story that it was like a little little parkour little demonic parkour incident and everybody got a bit panicky about it because of the context that was you know children speaking in really deep voices nobody knows what's going on everybody's frantic and this kid runs up the wall and does a flip so everyone's like whoa what's happening definite possession etc etc but that is not what they describe the social worker and the nurse do not describe that it seems like it was a slow protracted movement that this child walked up the wall and then flipped over and there are great articles out there as well skeptical articles that kind of take apart this story 
bit by bit. And one of the things that is pointed out is that all of the professionals who witnessed this say that the child didn't let go of his grandmother's hand during this kind of incident where he walked up the wall. So the sceptical part of it is, well, was he being physically supported by his grandmother to be able to do this feat? Was it quicker than what the nurse and the social worker remember? Like, did he actually walk slowly up the wall or did he run up the wall? Did he go up the wall backwards or has that been kind of shifted slightly because of the paranoia and the belief in demons around this particular case? Because people are fallible. That's the thing we always forget with these stories. You might say that this is what definitely happened, but you're never going to know what the objective truth is because we're basing all of our knowledge of this case on people's memories and then what they wrote down in reports. And then all of the professionals that went into the house afterwards, so the police, the social workers, etc., were they coloured by the fact that they knew this house was meant to be haunted and therefore things that they wouldn't ordinarily even think twice about suddenly became more threatening, scarier, tied in with all this talk of demons. And again, it's like I always say when we talk about first responder stories, like we always imagine the police, social workers, care workers, health workers or whatever to be these sort of vessels of objectivity, that what they see or what happens is the truth because we hold them in positions of power when actually they are still human beings at the end of the day they have their own belief systems they have their own beliefs about demons ghosts whatever it is and that is obviously going to be a framework for how they understand the things that they see in front of them and if you already believe in demons and demonology and you're going into a demon house and there's kids running up the walls and kids speaking in really deep voices etc etc are you going to attribute things to the paranormal that you wouldn't ordinarily I don't know. I think so. I think this story is a great story. But do I necessarily think that that house was haunted? Or do I necessarily think that there was demons involved? I don't think I do. But let me know what you think. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Remember all the links to everywhere that I got my information are all linked in the description of this episode. If you would like to send in a story to Real Life Ghost Stories, you can do so by emailing it to Podcast at gmail.com. If you want more information about the podcast, you can check out the website, Podcast at gmail.com. And if you are desperate for extra content, you can sign up to Patreon. That is patreon.com forward slash Real Life Ghost Stories, where for $5 a month or $2 a month you get access to heaps of extra content as well as every single main and mini episode completely ad free and on that note i shall see you next time